One month after 276 girls were kidnapped in northeastern Nigeria, the United States is flying manned surveillance missions to try and find them. At the same time, Nigeria is weighing whether or not to negotiate with the Boko Haram terrorists who took the girls in April. Today, new video obtained by NBC News shows just how well armed Boko Haram is and the level of threat they pose to the region. Military officials in Cameroon say the impressive weapons cache of RPGs, mortars, AK 47s, and anti aircraft weapons was seized from Boko Haram three weeks ago, just after the schoolgirls were kidnapped. Video released Monday by Boko Haram showing what's believed to be more than 100 of the kidnapped girls has now been viewed by some family members, including one mother who says she spotted her daughter among the girls sitting on the ground and wearing veils. The head of one civic group in the region told the AP he believes the government is likely to communicate the next course of action if some family members verify that their children appear in the video. But as this crisis continues and the international spotlight remains on Nigeria's government, the question is what steps will be taken and what, if anything, can be done to combat Boko Haram? Joining me now is Carl Levan. He's an assistant professor at the School of International Science at American University in Washington, D.C. And, sir, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I want to start with the fact that you actually are a person who's not just an expert on this region or on Boko Haram, but someone in whom the State Department has actually uh, confided. Um, you wrote a letter in May of 2002 when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, essentially saying not to designate Boko Haram at that time, at least, as a terror organization. And this is what you wrote. So you wrote an FTO designation, which means for foreign terror. Terrorist organ, uh, foreign terrorist organization designation would internationalize Boko Haram, legitimize abuses by Nigeria's security services, limit the State Department's latitude in shaping a long-term strategy, and undermine the U.S. government's ability to receive effective independent analysis from the region. Now that Boko Haram has essentially internationalized itself uh, by taking these girls and sparking this international outcry, w w would, have you changed your mind about really what, how they should be designated, at least by the United States? Well, thank you for having me on the program, Joy. The important thing is that the State Department changed its mind, and it's changed its mind based on evolving intelligence and based on a situation in Nigeria that spiraled downward. And unfortunately, many of the things that we were very concerned about happened independent of the FTO designation issue in 2012, such as the internationalization of the group and such as an escalation of a cycle of violence between the state and between the Boko Haram uh, Islamic radical insurgents. So, you know, we're facing a very dire situation now, and the eyes of the world are all watching uh, those girls and the desperate situation that they are in right now. And, sir, I think when we learned um, from the Cameroon government um, just how well armed Boko Haram potentially is, that sent a lot of alarms, uh, I think, through a lot of Americans, particularly as U.S. Uh, military flights begin over that country to try to find the girls. Just how dangerous from a military standpoint is this terrorist organization? They've proven themselves to be a lethal and surprisingly random organization. They staged attacks on the U.N. headquarters in Abuja. They staged attacks at the Department of State Security, the, uh, one of the most secure government facilities in Nigeria. And before that, there was a long string of attacks on police stations and other government insta installations. But aside from those harder targets, there have also been, as everyone knows now, attacks on schools and attacks on civilians. Uh, just a few years, just a few weeks ago, there were attacks at a motor park for commuters who go into Abuja called Nanya. And, that, and those attacks were followed up not too long ago by additional attacks. And I've spent time in Nanya, and this is a place where civil servants might gather before they commute into the city. So it's They've be proven themselves to be a very lethal organization, and the region is awash in arms. And so this makes uh, the small arms issue and these, these lethal small arms issue an especially intractable part of the solution that uh, the regional collaboration is going to have to confront. Yeah, and indeed, I mean, one of the things that this group has done and their leaders done is do this sort of perversion of what they're calling Islam, that, of course, Muslim leaders around the world are saying it is not. Um, but they are using that sort of religious um, sort of pretext to attack civilians in their own country. I want to play you uh, a soundbite of, of a young woman who was a victim of Boko Haram, not related to this specific incident, but she told her story. Uh, and take a listen um, to that, and let's talk about that as aspect of what they've done. My dad refused to deny his faith, and then they shoot him th um, three times in his chest. If my brother stay, he would grow up and become a pastor like my dad. So the leader told him to 
kill him too. So they go ahead and shoot him twice in his chest, and then he fall down and died. So I was I was in shock. I don't know what was happening. And, and Professor Levan, this group has been doing this with impunity, without any international notice for a very long time. Clearly, what has the Nigerian government done about this group to date? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's one of the things that's a very important shift, I think, in the last couple of weeks. The Nigerian government has generally responded with a very heavy-handed response. Uh, this began in 2009 when the leader of Boko Haram, at that time Mohammed Youssef, was summarily executed and his execution was broadcast in public view. And so uh, that started a tit-for-tat game, if you will, between very deadly game between the government and between Boko Haram. And so, Boko, and so the government has responded to Boko Haram by declaring a state of emergency in three northern states, Yobi, Adamawa, and Borno. And just today, President Goodluck Jonathan requested an extension of that state of emergency. And this is one of the reasons, I think, for the outrage in the Bring Back Our Girls movement, is that many of the families of the victims and many civil society leaders and human rights activists in Nigeria are asking, how can it be possible to move 270-odd girls in the middle of the night in a state that is already under a state of emergency with an expanded military presence. And so this has uh, directed a great deal more frustration at the Nigerian government, and this is what led them, I think, to change their position about the role of the international community. Yeah, indeed. Not to mention the fact that the Good Luck Jonathan government has not exactly been open to the protests. They've actually been trying to stop those, too. So I think there's a lot to talk about. Hopefully, sir, you will come back. There's a lot more to talk about on this. I think every parent cares about this story. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Joy. All right. Thank you.